In just a few moments, the ushers will pass out the welcome tablets. We want everyone to sign in today and let us know how we can best serve you. If you are joining us online, we want to hear from you as well. Look for the check-in information on the homepage of our website and let us know that you are joining us. Founders Metropolitan Community Church is a place of diversity and welcome, a place of healing and acceptance, a place of deep spirituality and transformation, a place of joy and love, Welcome to Founders Metropolitan Community Church, Los Angeles. Now let's try it again. How about that? For our call to worship, the prophets of old spoke of God's justice even when it was unwelcome. Who will hear their message? We will listen and we will hear. Responding to God's call, Jesus traveled, preaching and teaching to all who would listen. Who will hear and respond to his message? We will listen, we will hear, and we will respond. Christ sent out disciples two by two to spread the good news in any place that would welcome them. Who will hear their message? We will listen, we will hear, and we will go. God's prophets are among us still, around the world and in these pews. Who will hear their message? We will listen, we will hear, and we will go. Please remain as you are for our opening song.
music director is out of town today, and we want to say thank you to Peter for stepping in. <laughs> Our usual people are not running anything today. How about that? <laughs> but we're going to have church. Is that all right with you? <laughs> I'm Reverend Keith Mazingo, and I'm delighted to have you in worship with us. Uh, we're delighted to have you in with us if you're joining us online today. And we hope that you will hang around with us and watch it just get better and better and better. And, um, you know, when, the, when we're here and the Spirit's here, that's all that really matters, isn't it? The rest of it's just gravy and all that's good. But we are delighted that you have joined us here in service. We're delighted to have new folks with us joining us from Florida, uh, MCC of the Palm Beaches. Let's welcome our ladies. Yay! Yay! Tell me who this is. And from Australia, we're in Australia. We're in Australia. Help us. Sydney. Sydney. Welcome. Yes. We're delighted that you're with us as well. You just never know who's going to end up at the home, a home church, at the mother church, right? At Founders Metropolitan Community Church. Would you have a word of prayer with me, and then we're going to pass our peace. God, thank you for this time we have to be in this place, in this moment, in this time. We thank you that, God, every time we show up, that your spirit just comes and blesses us over and over and over again. And God, on this special day of having folks with us from around the world, let us, God, all lift up one voice in concert, in prayer, and in praise to be a blessing to one another, and to receive the blessings you have for us today. We ask in the name of Jesus our Christ and all that is holy. Amen. Amen. And now will you greet one another and welcome each other. Chapter 12, verses 6 through 10, taken from the Message Translation of the Bible. The Apostle Paul writes, If I had a mind to brag a little, I could probably do it without looking ridiculous, and I'd still be speaking plain truth all the way. But I'll spare you. I don't want anyone imagining me as anything other than the fool that you'd encounter if you saw me walking on the street or heard me talk. Because of the ex extravagance of those revelations, and so I wouldn't get a big head, I was given the gift of a handicap to help me in constant touch, to keep me in constant touch with my limitations. Satan's angels did his best to get me down. What he did, in fact, was he pushed me to my knees. No danger then of walking around high and mighty. At first, I didn't think of it as a gift, and I begged God to remove it. Three times I did that, and then God told me, My grace is enough. It's all you need. My strength comes into its own in your weakness. Once I heard that, I was glad to let it happen. I quit focusing on the handicap, and I began appreciating the gift. I'm gonna read that one again. I quit focusing on the handicap, and I began to appreciate its gift. All right. It was a gift. It was a case of Christ's strength moving in on my weakness. Now I take limitations in stride, and with good cheer. These limitations that cut me down to size, abuse, accents, opposition, and bad breaks. 
I just let Christ take over, and so the weaker I get, the stronger I become. Please rise as you're able. <laughs>
you really just hear about my life a lot um, and what I, what I go through and what happens to me, and I just invite you to go along the journey with me. So I have a confession. You will hear me have lots of confessions along the way. Here's one from way back. I did not want to be a pastor. I confess it. I never have. I never wanted to be a pastor. I watched my well, not that I didn't want to do ministry. I wanted to be an evangelist. I uh, watched my dad and my stepmother go in and, and all through my middle school and high school years, they were evangelists. And I saw how we would go to school and work all day and then come in and try to grab a bite on the way out the door or oftentimes eating in the car on the way to some church out of town. And they would go in and they would have to have prayed up ahead of time, you see. Because you couldn't do it that week. You had to do it way in advance. I, I, I don't know how I didn't connect that the Holy Spirit can actually speak weeks in advance. But <laughs> sometimes the Holy Spirit speaks weeks in advance. And they would have these sermons all ready to go. And we would kind of go into these churches. And they would give these wonderful sermons. And, and, and speak profound things that only the Spirit could have shown them because we didn't know what was going on in those local churches. We didn't know the people. We didn't know the congregation. We weren't involved in their everyday life. And I saw what the power of God would do through them and how the Spirit would wreak havoc in those congregations. And then just, we would leave. You know, then we would go. And, and then it was up to them to work through all of that stuff and allow the Holy Spirit to give them that. So I had this idea that I wanted to do what my parents were doing. I wanted to go in to a church and have that power of the Holy Spirit surge and prophetically speak over a congregation and then leave. You know, now here's, here's the problem with that. You see, then you leave, right? Then you leave. Then you leave. So you, you don't have to work through anything. You just go and pronounce it and you leave. That's the good thing with the prophets of old. Yes, they came and spoke their word and then they left. Sometimes they got beheaded before they got out of town, but they left. <laughs> Depending, and one, I, I was reading one, one this week and it was like, they said, don't, don't you come back here. The king told him, said, don't, you go prophesy somewhere else. You go live somewhere else. We don't want you in this town anymore. We don't want your prophecy. I remember the, the power of God moving so strong. In particular, there was, I, we all have our favorite. You have, if you grow up in church and you have evangelists come in and do revivals, my favorite was Reverend Nina Ballard. I love this woman minister. She would not, she wouldn't go out to eat with us after church. She wouldn't come ahead of time and talk to anybody. She had been prayed up and she was anointed ahead of time and God had given her messages for the church and she did not want anything that distracted her from giving that word to that church for that time. And I saw how the Spirit moved through her and I wanted to be the male version, sort of male version, of <laughs> Nina Ballard. I wanted to be Nina Ballard and walk around with that kind of anointing and that kind of power. And I remember one particular time, our church was going through a real trial. There were, and, and we didn't know what was causing it. We didn't know why there was, it was outside interference, but we didn't know where it was coming from. Why, I mean, we knew where it was coming from. We didn't know why it was coming and, and, and how it had the potential to destroy. Now, I said that I watched my parents when I was younger um, evangelize, but when I went off to college, my dad started pastoring a church. And so I got to see that side of being in the parsonage, so to speak, um, and, and watching my dad get involved with people's lives. Because see, when you're, you're the pastor, you get to do the weddings and the funerals and the hospital visits, and you get to go out to eat with the people and you get involved in their lives, in the ministries, and you see the day-to-day, -day, and a lot of times, if you're the pastor, you carry the weight of whatever they're going through. Because, it, well, I will say if you're a good pastor. How about that? <laughs> if, you're, if 
good, Pastor. You carry the weight of what they're going through. You, and, and why do you do that? So that you're helping them and it's a reminder that you are to constantly keep them in prayer and keep them lifted up and keep them supported for what they're going through. And you share their lives and then they share yours. And I remember going through this major trial in my dad's church and Reverend Nana came to do a revival. And I remember one night she, she would walk out in the congregation sometime and she would start, she would point her finger. And if you started pointing her finger, you know the Holy Spirit was about to tell you something and it was profound and you best hear it. And you didn't have any choice because you'd have this Holy Ghost goose pimples and you were scared to move. I'm just telling you, when you saw the Spirit of God come up through Reverend Nina like that, you were just like, ooh, I, I want to hear every word. It, you could hear a pin drop. And she came to my daddy and she pointed over him and she prophesied over him. And she said, there is jealousy coming from outside of this church over your ministry and what you're doing right here. And what you're doing to this community and there are other ministers. There are other ministers that are not happy with what you're doing right here. And they're coming after you. They're trying to sit you down because they're not doing what God's called them to do. And they don't have the creativity and the anointing that you have and they, they want you to stop. So they're attacking your church. And as soon as she said it, it was like that. It was like a light bulb went on to all of us. And we all knew. Because you see, the Holy Spirit doesn't just stop there with calling it out. The Holy Spirit says, here's what I'm going to do about this. Here's what I'm going to do about this. And the Spirit said, you just keep doing what you're doing. I got this. I've got this, you just keep doing. If they call you before councils, you just go, I'll give you the words. And they did. They called a whole parcel of us before councils. And we all left intact. We all left victorious. I wanted to be not a Ballard. I wanted to have that kind of spirit. There was just one little thing holding me back. Hmm. It had a rainbow on it. <laughs> See, all that worked well in the church of God that I grew up in, but they were not going to have a rainbow sheep up there preaching to them. They were not going to have a rainbow evangelist. Now, they probably had some rainbow evangelists. <laughs> But I didn't think I could do that. And even when I went off to college, to a Church of God college, and tried to major in Bible to become a minister, and I finally just said, this can't happen. And I was dating a young lady and engaged to a young lady who had the same Holy Spirit that I had. And then one night she calls me and says, I can't marry you. I said, why not? She said, because you're a homosexual and it won't do me any good. <laughs> now that was something he could not admit to himself, but when, you're, when, when your fiancé is sitting there saying, I, I haven't slept in two weeks, the Holy Spirit has kept me awake talking to me, and she told me things that had happened from my childhood on. Not necessarily bad things, just things that had happened. And thoughts I'd had. Hmm. And I thought to myself, well, I guess ministry is not for me after all. And now what do I do? Well, let's fast forward a few years because obviously a lot of working through when, and I won't tell you all of that. But I found Metropolitan Community Church, which saved my life. And years later, I decided to not just not be on the piano stool anymore, which is what I was doing at my dad's church. I decided that I would pursue that call I had heard a long time ago to be an evangelist. Here's the problem. We got up at General Conference and Reverend Troy Perry said, we don't have, we're, we're starting this Samaritan College. We've got people coming. However, we don't have enough pastors to fill pulpits. So until we get pastors in all the pulpits, we're not offering any other degree. <sighs> I 
I was like, Lord, here we go again. So I started taking those classes at Samaritan College thinking, well, maybe we'll grow so fast and get so many pastors so fast that they'll start offering classes for us who want to be evangelists, those of us who want to be evangelists, and I'll finally get to do what I want to do. And look where that landed. <laughs> I want to tell you something. I love going home to visit my folks, just so you're aware. My parents are gone, my grandparents are gone. I have a few aunts left and a few cousins. A lot of cousins, actually. And I love to go to Eastern North Carolina to visit with them. But I want to tell you something that happens to me every time I go. They all know I'm a minister. They all know that I'm ordained. They've seen me come up to the hospital when some of them's been sick. And there's always this little hesitancy. They'll say, well, he's a minister. You're a minister. Will you have prayer? Because they're praying people. They're good Pentecostal praying people. And I always feel this something squeeze in my stomach when I go. And when they ask me to pray in front of them, because they've heard me pray many times before when I was in the church of God and I was shrouded in secrecy. Didn't have any problems praying with them then. But now in front of them, I feel this sort of shrinking back, shrinking back, because I turn into this, I don't know if this happens to any of you, when you go back home to wherever you grow up, I, I turn into that little boy again in the church of God that wants to please his parents and wants to please everybody else and wants to be the best little boy in the church and the best little boy in town. And I feel like a young child again that's trying to please everyone. And I always wonder when I go in, I don't have the confidence that I have anywhere else in the world. I've been to Australia. Ask me to pray in Sydney. I'll pray there and on the street, in the hospital, in a restaurant, wherever you ask. Now, just, you know, we can go. We can, let's pray. Let's anoint. Let's do what we need to do. We can have church anywhere we are. And I can go in full confidence. But send me back to my hometown, to my home church, to my home folks. And I just turn into this little jelly jar and, 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 and can't, can't, have the confidence yet. I'm still growing up. Give me a few minutes. I'm still getting there. I'm still working on it. And when we hear this story of Jesus where he goes back to his hometown, see, he has left them long ago and gone out to other places. You know what happens when you go out to other places? You learn other ways. You learn other things. That evangelist part of you takes over and you begin to learn other people and other things. And if you settle somewhere else, you, that pastoral part of you, you become part of the community. You become part of a new culture, a new way of doing things. Now, I lived, I've lived in, in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and I've lived in, in uh, Raleigh, North Carolina, and I'm from Goldsboro, North Carolina. And, and I've lived here in Los Angeles, and I've lived in Baton Rouge. And I want to tell you, every state you live in has a different culture. Every country you get into is a different culture. And you can keep narrowing it down right down to your local church has a different culture than where you grew up with and where you came from. And I don't know if you do, when I go back to that original thing, like I said, I turn into that, bowl, well, maybe it's a bowl of jelly. Because it can wiggle, it can get out. <laughs> Jesus goes out and learns other cultures and other ways of doing things. And he has these people that he has created, this community of people that, he's, that he has created. And I often wonder about Jesus. Did he, I mean, we always think of Jesus at the end of his life. The mature Jesus at 33, as mature as we are, I'm going to just tell you, I'm a lot more mature now than I was at 33. And I've learned a whole lot since, I, since 33. I mean, that was almost half a life ago. 
And what had you... See, we look at Jesus as having full knowledge and all this stuff, but I wonder if Jesus was finding his way just like we find our way. And when he had gone away from what he knew, maybe he became, when he went back home, maybe he became that little boy that was trying to please Mary. Maybe he was that little boy that was trying to please everybody at home. And maybe that's why, because I used to wonder, why did Jesus say, well, a prophet's without honor in their own country. It's hard to get anything done when you go back home. And maybe now I understand why it was so hard for them to do ministry where he came from. They were ready. They had done ministry all over the place. They had prayed for people and people had gotten healed. They had prayed over people and people had been released from their demons. They had prayed over People and, 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 and dead people got up and walked. That kind of power, that kind of evangelistic work where you go in and that kind of anointing and it happens on the spot and then you leave. They had been doing that. But then when Jesus goes back to his hometown, not much happens. And Jesus says to his disciples, well, here's what I want you to do. Go out two by two. Because you know you need somebody to support you. And you need somebody to keep you in prayer. Now another one can lift up. Hopefully you're not down at the same time. That's a depressive mess right there. <laughs> but for your own safety, sometimes you go out two by two. And he says, take the message and do what you've been called to do. And I think sometimes Jesus just knew he couldn't get it done. In fact, it says at the end of that scripture, did you get that? That he said he was able to heal a few people and bless a few people pretty much on his way out of town. And I'm not suggesting that we can never ever go back home. And I'm not suggesting that we can't go back home and do ministry. I am suggesting to you that whatever we are called to do, whether it's evangelistic ministry, whether it's pastoral ministry, whether it's feeding hungry people, Brother Martin, whether it's closing those who don't have, whether it's going to visit someone in the hospital, whether it's sending someone a note, whether it's smiling at a stranger on the sidewalk. Whatever we are called to do, we're not on the results committee. That's what I have to keep reminding myself that I'm not on the results committee. I have to stay focused on the call that God has over my life. And even though I wanted it to be evangelistic in some long-term sense, I guess it has been. But I love that I am a pastor. I'm glad that God helped me to love that. Because I love walking the journey with other people. It means that we're not always perfect. It means that everything won't always run just right. Oh, well. I'm not on the results committee. What I do know is I've been called, and you've been called, and we've been called to walk this journey together for a while, for as long as God will let us. And then we walk somewhere else, whether it's on this side or on the other side. If I can stay focused, the Apostle Paul said, I know what my calling is and I can let it give me a big head. See, he worked as an evangelist. He could go in and start all these churches and get them going. But remember, he, as an evangelist, he went in and he, he would start the church and he would stay with them until they got going on their own and then get a local minister. And then he went over and did, he was good at church planting. And remember that they weren't very good churches. They were long-lasting churches, but they weren't all that great. You know how I know? If they were, we wouldn't have most of the New Testament. <laughs> all of those letters of reprimand and describing how they supposed to be living and whatever was going on in their 
churches at the time that we have now canonized and think we're supposed to take all of it. You know, be careful with that. Just remember the audience and whatever they were going through at the time. Sometimes we forget that part of it. And also, just to, you know, I'll throw this in for extra, you don't have to pay for this, is that remember if you look at the young Paul minister and the old Paul minister, the more mature one, his, his, his teachings have changed a little bit. He, he's not so lawful as he is graceful. He was very lawful at the beginning of his ministry. He was very graceful at the end. He had mellowed out and maybe had to rethink some of those things and wished that he had not written them all those years ago. Woo! I wished he hadn't written some of them too. <laughs> I'm glad he tried to clarify some of it by the end of his life. Here's the deal. We are all called by God. We are all given gifts of grace. We are all given gifts of ministry. And as long as we can stay focused on that. See, Jesus, I think Jesus would have had a lot better results had he not worried so much about being the best little boy when he went home. I think he'd have had a lot more results in his hometown. And I will tell you that the last couple of times I've been home, I've gone with more confidence going with more confidence because I'm sure of my call and I do want them to love me and I don't want to upset the waves. I don't want to make any waves at home and I don't want to upset their lives and I'm watching them grow. Sometimes you grow by leaving. Sometimes you grow where you are and they grow up. They're growing too. Most of them. They're a handful that just aren't going to have it. That's okay. It doesn't have to make me leave with hurt feelings. It makes me leave knowing I have to keep doing what I'm doing. And keep my focus on the call that I me. Because that's when I have peace. That's when I have real anointing. Is when I'm focused on what God has called me to. And I want to encourage you to stay focused on your call. Don't worry about the results. Let God take care of that. I hope that God calls us all to do lots of wonderful things. And remember that most of what we do is not up here in this pulpit. Most of what we do is not up here on the stage. Most of what we do is not even in this building on Sunday mornings. Most of our ministry is outside of these walls into our own communities, into our own jobs, into our own cities, our own states, our own countries. And that's all right. Stay focused on that. Not just now, every day. It makes us ordinary people move in extraordinary ways. Amen.
This is the time for our announcements. And for those of you who are joining us online, we would invite you to prepare the elements that you will use to share with us in communion. For those of you, uh, you here as the ushers pass the welcome tablets, we would invite you to, uh, uh, to sign in here, also to check in online. This has been a busy time in uh, our church. Uh, the flowers this morning are from the wedding yesterday of uh, Sarah Hansen and uh, Jason Nickel. And so some of us who are uh, serving today um, also served last night. Uh, a certain wedding planner over here. You know those gay wedding planners. Um, I better not say uh, anymore, but Roger did uh, a great job organizing all of us and keeping us all on track uh, for the wedding. For those of you who are visiting with us the first time, we want to invite you to our uh, fellowship time immediately following service. It's out the front doors and around the corner to the second set of doors to uh, join us in our fellowship hall. And uh, as we look at our bulletins, uh, uh, perhaps uh, the most impactful thing that happened in our lives this week is one of our longtime members, uh, Glenn Payne, uh, passed away. Uh, he had been a member since uh, 1973 and served as an usher and also did a couple of ministry things uh, that I'll share with you when, um, uh, when we receive the offering. But uh, for now, uh, we have the joy of uh, receiving new members into uh, our church family. And so I'm going to invite uh, Reverend Alex uh, to receive the first transfer of membership So first of all, it was, uh, it's an honor that uh, Reverend Keith asked me. So why are we doing this? Because officially, Reverend Keith is not a member in good standing yet. Yeah. <laughs> we will fix this momentarily. So I want to read the letter of transfer of membership from uh, Baton Rouge. Dated July 3rd, Founders MCC. Dear Mr. Owens, in response to your formal request, please consider this, the document, to transfer the membership of Keith Mozingo from our church to Founders MCC. Reverend Keith Mozingo has been a member in good standing, that's good to know, <laughs> at MCC Baton Rouge from January 2007 to the present time. Our board of directors, our leadership, and our congregation wish Keith Mozingo and your church and congregation the very best spiritual journey together. If you need any further information, please do not hesitate to contact us. Amen. Amen. So, um, it's a pleasure to be able to receive Reverend Keith as a member of Founders MCC. It's a blessing for me to be able to do this, so thank you very much. So, the individual before you is called up, um, and usually we ask what their, you know, who are you and where are you from? But I think we kind of know this already. I'm gonna answer you a few questions, Reverend Keith. Will you commit to a life of prayer, praying daily for our church, our denomination, and our leaders and congregants? I will. Will you commit to a life of service, giving of your time, talents, treasure, and testimony? I will. Will you commit to follow FMCC's mission and vision, its core values, relationship with God, involvement in an inclusive community, and call to justice? I will. Will you commit to specific ministries, either in or for FMCC? I will. 
Now, in standing before the congregation, I will anoint you with water and with oil. The water is a, is a reminder of our baptismal vows. Now, some of you may say, well, I don't quite remember that. Um, <laughs> but Reverend Keith does. <laughs> so, uh, and, so, and we will also anoint with oil because the reality is being a member requires spiritual warfare and spiritual blessings. Come on up, Rick. So the water was left before service. So Reverend Keith Mosinko, I bless you in the name of God our Creator. Jesus the Redeemer and the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. I also anoint you. May you have clarity of mind that that which is not God may be minimized so that you can focus only on what God is asking you to. May you speak the truth always. May you see God's holy creation in every person, every aspect of what surrounds you. And may your heart and your hands be a reminder that you accept all people and that these hands create, you can also break down that which you peace. So pray with me. Loving God, we give thanks for Reverend Keith as he embarks on a new journey as a member of Founders Metropolitan Community Church. May the fire that you have instilled in him continue to be the fire that inspires us to be the very best of who we can be individually and as a Now, will you? the congregation's community support of, of this newest member to keep them in prayer and to mentor them as it is. If so, will you stretch out their hand and will you bless them by simply saying we welcome you, Reverend? Thank you. It's so moving. Um, and I've been baptized a whole lot of times. <laughs> Seems like it just gets better every time. Amen. Um, one of the reasons that we did that and did that first is because we have some other people who would like to join our church. And it's usually the, the role of the senior pastor to bring those people into the church. And so I would invite them to come at this time. To, uh, one second, okay, all right, um, we have people that have been through our membership class who was taught by Reverend Steve Swafford here, and we want to say thank you to Reverend Steve, would you thank him? <laughs> we appreciate so much him taking uh, this opportunity to, to work with people. We have some that are joining in this nine o'clock service. We also have some that will be joining in the 11 o'clock service. So um, if you um, want to hang around for the 11 o'clock, we'd love for you to do that as well. One of our next members is coming down the aisle now. So if they would come forward and just stand here in front of the congregation. Is this on? Do I need, do, uh, this is on, I don't need to hold up. There we go. So my brothers, let me ask you the same questions that were just asked of me. Will you commit to a life of prayer, praying daily for our church, our denomination, our leaders, and our congregants? Will you commit to a life of service, giving of your time, talents, treasure, and testimony? Will you commit to follow FMCC's mission and vision, its core values, which is a relationship with God, 
involvement in an inclusive community, and a call to justice? And will you commit to specific ministries, either in or for FMCC? Then in standing before this congregation, if you step back, very good. I first anoint you with this water as a sign. This is, as Reverend Alex explained so beautifully to you both, it's an outward sign of an inward experience. Something's already happened on the inside or they wouldn't be here, amen? Well, we wouldn't be here. It's already happened in there. This is just an outward sign in following Jesus' own example. And Reverend Alex is much more eloquent than I am with these things. But I anoint you both with oil as well. You're, all, you're both doing wonderful ministry for this church and with this church and in this community more than I can even call out because there are things that I know about, but there are other things that are happening that we will never know the results, at least on this side, because you've touched so many hearts and so many lives. And I will ask the congregation once again, will you be there to support these two new members in their ministries and their op the opportunities that lay before us and to be there for them when they need a little push? If so, would you raise your hands this way as we pray once again over these, our brothers. God, I praise you for these two wonderful, beautiful people. Thank you for bringing them to Founders MCC. Thank you for the ministry that they have been doing already. Thank you for the havoc that they are creating in the enemy's kingdom. Thank you that they are already doing so much to bless people in this community, in this church, where they are, where they're planted. And God, I pray for your anointing to continue to be over them as we welcome them into this place, into this house of worship, into this combined ministry that we give to you. Help us as a congregation to be there for them when they need us and to bless them. And we'll give you praise and glory for it's in your name we ask. Amen. 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 And just with a first name, tell us who you are. Mark. And would you welcome David and Mark. What a joy it is to receive uh, new members. And as I mentioned, uh, the passing of uh, Glenn Payne. Glenn, as uh, most of you know, was a longtime usher uh, in the congregation. Uh, he would also mail birthday cards to everyone on their birthdays with all these stickers and things on them. It was nice uh, to be remembered. But another thing Glenn did was um, he would do these one-man acts. This was when he was in his 80s. He's, he's passed now in his 90s. But in his 80s in West Hollywood, he would uh, do these one-man acts, and he would sit on the dais, and he'd have a telephone talking to God. <clears throat> And you couldn't hear God speak in the act, but uh, I remember one that was about uh, giving. Uh, he said, hello, who is this? And, oh, it's you. <laughs> and um, I want to talk about, he, God wanted to talk about the offering, and uh, he said, you want me to give how much <laughs> to the offering? <clears throat> so I thought, um, in memory of Glenn, I would share a little story with you about two members who, uh, uh, don't worry guys, they weren't, I don't think they were new members, but they were having a conversation after church, and, and one member asked the other member, he said, how do you decide to, uh, how much you're going to give to God? And he said, it's really easy, what I do is I draw a circle in the dirt around me, and I throw up all my money in the air, 
and whatever falls in the circle, I keep, and whatever falls outside of the circle, I give to God. So th this member said, oh, that's great. Um, uh, let me tell you how I decide how much I'm going to give to God. I also take my money and I throw it all up in the air, and whatever stays up in the air goes to God. <laughs> And whatever falls to the ground, uh, I get to keep. Um, and I tell you that story because uh, I believe that uh, God speaks to us today. And uh, I know in my life, uh, God speaks to me most clearly in the area of money and what I do with my money. And uh, I assume that for uh, everyone else. But... Um, I, as the ushers come, uh, we remember Glenn and his service, and uh, let me encourage you to give as, as God is leading you to give, as God is speaking to you. Please remain standing for our great thanksgiving. May God be with you. And also with you. We lift up our hearts. We lift them up, up to the Lord. God. Let us give thanks to God. It is, it is right, right to, to give, give our thanks, thanks and praise. praise. It is good, right, and a joyful thing to give thanks to our loving and gentle God. As we come before you in thankfulness and humility for all you have done for us. Let us become that beacon to the world of what love is for one another. Lend us your strength to live as you have made us to live. Lend us your love to love as you have asked us to love. Lend us your compassion to be compassionate to our neighbors, because all people are our neighbors. Help us to be patient and remember that all things happen in your time, not ours. Help us to greet each day with a new heart and to always be thankful for your love. We ask you to open the minds and hearts of those who would persecute us for being who you have made us to be. For these and all the prayers that are on our hearts, both spoken and unspoken, we pray to God as we sing together a prayer in the Spirit, the way Jesus taught us to pray.
Please be seated. Remember that Jesus Christ who invites us, all who are thirsty, to come and to be fed, who earnestly pray for all of us, even in the face of betrayal and crucifixion, and who calls us to break bread together, to love one another, and to include all those who desire and to share in this great table of fellowship. For we remember on that night that Jesus took the bread and he blessed it and he broke it. And he said, this is my body broke for you. Whenever you do so, do so in remembrance of me. Likewise, he took a cup and he gave thanks and passed all to that who had gathered so close to him. And he said, whenever you drink of this cup, my life essence, my blood poured out for you for, for the gifts for all time. Do so in remembrance of me. God of power, just as the spirit of life embodied Jesus in the tomb, so now breathe life in your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these gifts of bread and the fruit of the vine, that they may be for us the life of Christ. May we be empowered to make that life visible through our actions and love in the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. At Founders MCC, just as MCCs all over the world, you don't have to be a member of this church or any church, for this is God's table prepared for you. If you prefer to receive communion with no human intervention, please just know that we've set aside a sacred space, the elements, that will be prepared for you over on the left, for your right, for you just to be between you and with God. For all are welcome. The table has been prepared. We ask the ushers and acolytes come forward, for the feast has been prepared for you. Come for your welcome.
We are so delighted that you joined us in worship today, and we're so thankful for those who have joined and, and uh, joined our church today. Uh, again, we welcome these new folks with us today from Sydney, Australia, and MCC of the Palm Beaches in Florida. We want you to make sure you say hello to them on their way out. And um, just thank you. Thank you all for being here, being a part of this great church. Would you rise as you're able and join us in our closing song? Whether we are called as evangelists or pastors or feeders or encouragers or smilers or whatever else you have laid upon our hearts to do, we pray that you will bless us and anoint us as we go about that and help us not to worry about the results but to just be focused on the call that you have placed in each one of us. We ask these things in the name of Jesus our Christ and all that is holy. Amen. 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 Shake hands and be friendly. Outro? All right. <laughs> Thanks, Roger.